A successful research enterprise is run by multiple stakeholders, whereas the institute and researchers are pivotal to it, but equally important are the ones that support it. Although stakeholder financial support is uh, indeed required to realize the intellects and ideas, but with changing times, its paradigm has changed. It emphasizes supporting innovation and uh, improving healthcare outcomes. One such collaborative initiative set up by Tata Trust and Global Fund is the India Health Fund. Its mission is to support the development of promising technology and science-led solutions for diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of diseases. Today, we have Dr. Jayita Chaudhary with us, who is the Program Director at India Health Fund. Let me briefly introduce Jayita Chaudhary to you. She is a senior executive with 20 year, more than 20 years of experience in social development, impact, and philanthropy. She has worked extensively in India and South Asia, and her focus has always been on addressing health inequities under privileged communities in rural and remote areas. Jaita has played an instrumental role in setting up of different not-for-profit organizations and impactful initiatives like India Health Fund, which focuses on bridging gaps in healthcare by supporting innovation, development, and integration into health system. Jaita's expertise lies in program strategy, design and implementation, partnership building, policy and advocacy, capacity building, and of course, mentorship of many young professionals. I welcome you, Jaita, here and over to you. Uh, you are muted. A small request to the participants for any questions or discussions, kindly raise your hand or type in the questions. Okay. I think you can hear me now, right? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. And really thanks to YGIB for providing this opportunity to share about India Health Fund and our journey so far and what we have been doing and the potential it has in terms of bridging some of the gaps in the infectious disease space by uh, bringing in or by infusing uh, healthcare technology innovations in the area of uh, infectious diseases and how those can be integrated into healthcare systems. So we, we, I kind of walk you through uh, our journey so far the, the, and, and sort of, uh, you know, ex share our experience. And towards the end, would also like to hear your thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Radhita, for this opportunity. So, um, India Health Fund's journey actually started in 2015-16. Um, and between the, uh, the genesis basically lies where Tata Trusts, as one of the largest non-sectorial uh, and non-sectoral uh, entities and one of the oldest in the countries uh, came together with the Global Fund uh, to set up this new health fund at that point in time. And the need for such a fund actually arose from the fact that um, most of the work on infectious diseases uh, including tuberculosis, which affect large number of Indians or, and, and people in the subcontinent and in some of the other lower and middle income countries. Uh, so diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, other vector-borne diseases, felt that large part of the uh, support was actually coming from international organizations and also from our own uh, government, uh, but we did see that uh, when it came to infectious diseases, which largely affect uh, the poorest of the poor, uh, was this funding gap uh, that there was funds for implementation, but when it came to technology and innovations, funds were limited. And the Indian funds were sort of limited. Uh, quite 
opposite to what we have seen in the developed countries where you know different sectors come in to support uh, technology research and science development so i think that the, the the bottom line is that you know there was that huge need the second thing that was observed uh, between the global fund and data trust at that point was that um, there is a market failure that the private sector you know related to the private sector because returns are not you know high on from diseases like tuberculosis and and if they put it into that framework of profit and loss then you know diseases such as these these neglected infectious diseases do not end up getting the kind of support uh, from the private sector, at least I'm talking about pre-COVID times, uh, that it deserves. So from that perspective, uh, the Tata Trust came on board and in with strategic support from the Global Fund, it set up this new fund called the India Health Fund. Uh, under the leadership of our chairman, Mr. Ratan Tata, and the whole and so in 2016 he himself launched it first of uh, august and the idea was that how these some of these neglected infectious diseases which are very controllable and treatable can be controlled can be overcome by bringing in innovations and when we talk about innovations here we mean innovations both in terms of science and technology, but also in terms of the ways of functioning, in terms of innovative business models or innovative financing models, uh, you know, which would promote that kind of an ecosystem and environment in India. So it was the whole idea was how could we sort of build that India for India kind of an uh, environment in the country. So that's that was the journey. So the whole vision was that a group of stakeholders would come together and sort of ensure that you know the appropriate innovations are supported and taken to scale through this entire journey from lab to last mile as we say so these are some of the pictures from the launch date which i would like to share with you you can see of course mr tata but also other representatives from the government from the global fund from usa so this was in 2016 so basically who we are, you know, what we do. So basically the idea was that how can we uh, TB, you know, where there are a huge number of deaths. Malaria obviously also used to see a lot of deaths in the country, but numbers have started declining. But on the other hand, we have seen other sort of vector-borne diseases increase in the country. So by this time, we had already seen that the international funding community had already put in a lot of resources, mainly towards, I would say, uh, implementation kind of program. So when we started, the genesis was that how India Health Fund could be sort of, you know, positioned in a manner which could accelerate India's progress towards elimination of these diseases, you know, infect some of these infectious diseases. So that was the sort of the starting point. And in order to do that, we would need to address some of the funding gaps that lie, which lie from product development to market access to kind of, you know, to the to finally taking innovations of these products to the last mile population. On the other hand, it was also seen that, you know, we were seeing this more and more uh, emergence of the startup ecosystem, you know, uh, and, and mid-sized entities also coming into picture and also research institutions like yours who were already doing a lot of research. But, but all of it, we were observing that it needed that sort of uh, boost, you know, to take forward innovations or, or you know, high-end research to the last mile population, but there would be multiple stages in between. So IHF therefore was set up mainly to uh, to play the role of a catalytic fund or as we say, an aggregator platform, sort of function as a pooled financing mechanism by bringing in new novel health financing models to support more and more innovations, to support more and more 
sort of uh, business models or scale up models or financing models or partnership models, which could take forward or give a push to some of these innovations to actually move from bench to the bedside or move from lab to the last mile through those different stages. And so that was the whole idea that while such, uh, you know, models did exist in the West, but how we could kind of come in to address this fragmented sort of, uh, you know, um, space that was already existed. It's not like things were not happening. A lot was already happening, but it was happening in silos and fragmented manner. And therefore, India Health Fund was conceived to play that aggregator role, which could kind of bring some of these stakeholders together. Now, what's the theory of change? Now, that's the high level sort of a vision, but what's the theory of change? The main idea is that an entity like ours, where we call that we are a catalytic fund, we sort of de-risk the development of innovations with the primary focus on strengthening health system. So on the one hand, there are technology developers, you have scientists, and on the other hand, there is the healthcare system. How do we sort of bring these two together? So de-risking is something that India Health Fund definitely does. So when we break this whole thing down, you know, into different pieces, uh, right from, you know, um, inputs to the impact level, we do it at different stages. So at an input stage, we see that, what do we mean when we say we de-risk development? So we come in at a mid-stage. So we, India Health Fund does not come in to play a role in the early stage, or rather, I would say in the ideation stage. We typically have our problem statements laid out, and then we see how identify and evaluate innovations, which are at the mid stage of red technology readiness level, maybe, you know, four or five. And where a prototype is already there and where uh, already there is, uh, you know, some data available. And then Iron Chef comes in to evaluate those, select those, shortlist those, and we take it as under the fold of our portfolio. And we provide grant capital, grant support, to help them for the product development, product refinement, clinical validation, and not just that, the feasibility of that. You know, how finally, when it has been approved, how it can be validated at a community level. If it's a community-based solution, if it's a primary healthcare solution, how we can establish the feasibility of it, you know, how the cost effectiveness can be proven or the health technology assessment can be done. Now, all of this, as easy as it may sound, it is fairly complex. And we learned it fairly early that and just one entity cannot do it. Already, there are many players like yourselves who are already working on this area. Uh, so we, can, right from the start, we ensured that we bring expertise from different sectors. We bring stakeholders, we bring research institutions, we bring independent and individual experts, we bring government departments like the Central TB Division, like the National Vector Bond Disease Control Program, like ICMR, like the uh, affiliated institutions of ICMR, bring implementers from the ground who are actually practicing, who are actually delivering care. So we bring these diverse forces together to see, okay, how they can actually guide, how they can help us select an innovation. So it is a very robust, rigorous, at the same time, a sort of an objective process where all these players come together to not only help shape our problem statements, but also help us in selecting the right innovations and also help in terms of the technical guidance thereon and the evidence generation and building the use cases. Because our, our premise is that we do not just want to go on supporting innovations after innovations or research after research. We would rather pick something where the end user, which is the government in cases of these neglected diseases largely, they see a strong need to breakthrough sort of solutions, you know. So we make sure that whatever use cases we have, a problem statements we have, it comes from the end users or those who are on the front line. So that's at our input level. But the whole vision is what will this lead to? So even if we give the grant support, so what we ensure is that anything that we support, we are able to 
you know, increase more and more innovations which can be taken to scale. So, and I'm going to tell you as we move forward, we would have screened multiple innovations. So more than thousand innovations we would have screened in the last four years. You know, we got launched in 2016, but we were registered as India Health Fund in 2017. And from there to now, we would have screened about more than thousand, nearly 1200 innovations. But what we have supported is a smaller number, you know, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. So we intentionally pick those which are at that mid stage and which can bring about that, you know, impact through our support and through our partner support and can be taken to scale. So, and we know, as I said, we cannot do this ourselves. So leveraging collaborations become very important, both because we have that vision and that farsightedness, it has to be adopted. And it needs to get into the healthcare system, public sector and private sector both. And we also believe that it is whatever we are supporting today in terms of our port through our portfolio, it is not just for India, but India for the world. That's the whole vision. And if we also see something outside India, which is not here, we would be open to looking at those and see how we can create those collaborations from outside to here to bring that and to build that within the country. But how do we do that? You know, it is not again through just IHF support, it is through a pool financing mechanism. So these are at our like short term sort of outputs. But with the long term view that which we divide it an outcome and an impact level that whatever we support has to finally be better than what we have today. So we are not going to support something which is going to be incrementally better in terms of accuracy. It has to be substantially better for primary healthcare. That is our main focus. It has to improve access. Otherwise, it's not going to make any difference. It has to be available at an affordable price. Finally, whatever we are supporting should be easy to use, should be, should be efficient and effective. Ultimately, with that last panel that we are showing is the same impact that we will save lives. You know, anything that we support, we start from today, but in four to five years time or three to five years time has to get into the system and generate uh, impact, which will be either in terms of more number of patients being uh, uh, diagnosed, screened, treated, better tools that will be available with the healthcare providers, better patient experiences, and finally reduce deaths on the diseases that we are supporting. So preventable deaths is what we are looking at. So this is our sort of the theory of change that we have. But And as you see those three blocks at the bottom, that's our sort of the three pillars, I would say, where we say that okay, this is our theory of change, but how will we do it? So we need to extract synergies. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We know there are fantastic organizations and institutions and a very strong growing startup ecosystem. So we believe we need to extract synergies and build based on this uh, commonality that we have. And very importantly, we are a, as we are a fund, but also ensure that we are not the only ones funding it. There are already so many others, but how do we bring them together? That's the aggregation role that we play. How do we boost more and more domestic financing and also attract finance from outside from the newly growing, you know, wealth that is there in the country, newly growing wealth right from in the last 10 to 15 years that we have seen, how we can synergize those, how do we bring those uh, you know, novel wealth that has been generated in the country, all towards fast tracking and accelerating innovations and uh, fast tracking to take them to the last mile population. So that's the ultimate goal. Okay, why is my screen stuck? Okay. Now, what is the long term goal and focus? Are like, you know, and I think this is one of the differentiator I would like to highlight here. Like, and I'm sure some of you must be thinking that why is IHF doing this? There are so many institutions in the country. Today, there are about what, 300 odd bio incubators in the country. We are another one. What is the difference? So we have seen that fragmentation and we have seen that silo. While there is a lot, 
deep Iraq and many of these incubators in terms of making resources available for early stage, you know, that ideation, early stage innovation and development of science and technology. But not often we have seen that they are actually talking to the Ministry of Health. You know, there that is, or those who are the departments who are actually providing care and services and implementing. And we have the that's the total trust experience and expertise that you know have been so they have sort of been on the ground, supported a large number of other NGOs who were on the ground and so in from more from a frontline service. And therefore, India Health Fund is well positioned to bring these two worlds together. And we have demonstrated some of that. So what we are essentially saying is that we are very primary healthcare focused. And whole soul goal is how can we strengthen primary healthcare in different areas by bringing breakthrough innovations into the system. So where do we, where will we were, where we are, and where do we want to go as, as, a, as a country? And from underinvestment in infectious diseases, R&D and innovation, we want to sort of, I think it has sort of COVID has already disrupted this, but we need to sustain this, that we need to revive the focus on infectious diseases. And we are very well aware that there is this huge double burden of NCDs at the same time. So it's not to say this versus that, but how can we focused on infectious diseases? 30% of the burden still is in infectious diseases. There are fit fatalities associated with that. So how can we boost that? How can we bring multi-stakeholders to boost this, not just the government, but private, not-for-profit, you know, industry together, along with research institutions together and the startup system. And the vision is that how can we have faster, accurate, better point-of-care diagnostics or, you know, clinical decision-making support systems and many other such things. Likewise, we have also seen that the the care continuum, you know, the value chain of continuum of care is also sort of fragmented. How can we bridge that? How can we sort of support innovations or technology platforms which will be integrated, you know, will allow that interoperability to happen, which will again have better outcomes in terms of, you know, either diagnosis, treatment or decision making. Third, surveillance, you know, we saw not only countries such as ours, but even the most of the developed countries of the world during COVID, we saw the whole, you know, surveillance mechanism, while it was known to be much better, but we saw most of the system sort of crumbling. And that's where we felt that, no, the surveillance system is something, it needs to be strengthened, and it will not just happen. We all know it needs to happen, but how can technology play a role there? How can we bring cutting-edge technology to improve our surveillance mechanism right from the bottom at the ground where the frontline workers are there to the topmost where the decision-making is happening? How can we sort of enable this through analytics, through new age technology? And it's going to therefore improve public health decision-making at one stage and also sort of make countries such as us better prepared for future outbreaks. There may not be a pandemic frequently, but at least outbreaks we should be able to forecast and be better prepared. But apart from just disease management, there are also other allied areas like you know, it's not just enough to have a better diagnostic tool or better therapeutics. How do you sort of address the supply chain gaps or logistics gaps, you know, how? So that's equally important. Uh, and therefore, we also look at, you know, those delivery mechanisms and how sort of innovations can uh, play a critical role in terms of bridging those gaps so that it's not that the tools and the devices which are available or which will be available can be taken to the healthcare providers and to the patients. But actually, so that's again sort of building on the theory of change and the premise of the hypothesis we I've been talking about, but all also clearly in alignment with the sustainable development goals. And we clearly see that it is in alignment, you know, with the different sort of um, sustainable development goals, whether it is in terms of the higher level, you know, uh, good health and well-being but also in terms of boosting innovation by bringing industry together, improving the infrastructure, reducing health inequality and inequities. You know, there are 
issues of poverty, gender, there is that intersectionalities, right? It's not just a product at the end of the day, but how there are barriers which we can also address. And nothing of this can be possible if we are not looking at communities. So always it's the communities which is at the center, patient-driven, community-driven, you know, bringing cities and, and agglomerates, you know, habitations together. And finally, none of this would be possible through any single entity. It's finally collaboration and partnerships towards the sustained goal. So this is sort of, again, building on the theory of change. Um, where do we go from here? You know, I'm still talking in terms of our, our theory of change. Now, okay, so, I, sorry, are you able to see the top panel? Or I'm just trying to see how we can... Yes, we are able to see. Yes, you're able to see, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So basically what we're saying is that, you know, we are outcome focused. We are impact focused. And again, you know, when we look at India Health Fund in comparison to various others, other, uh, you know, incubators or, or uh, the seed funds that are available or the private equities or the, or the venture capitalist funds or angel funds that are there, they're very different because because of this healthcare impact and outcome that we are focused on. So, you know, when we say what our outcomes are, our donor, our parent organization target to us is very clear what we will look at as impact or, you know, so we don't say, oh, number of innovations sort of startup supported or so much funds raised. Those are sort of outputs, you know, our clear cut outcome and impact is okay. If we have supported so many, how many will finally reach the last mile? So every quarter, every month, annually also, we'll have to, we are accountable and you know, we have to show that. That, okay, okay. if today we have a portfolio of 10 or 11 innovations from those 1,100 or 1,200 supported and if we have a strong pipeline, how many of it we are able to see will reach the healthcare system, you know? So that's what, and how many lives finally in six to seven years we'll be able to save. That's what we have to continuously sort of answer to. So what do we do? So IHF, we are very geography agnostic. So all these innovations that we support, rural or urban, as long as we stay true to the course and we are honest in terms of targeting, you know, the, 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 the neglected communities or the underserved communities where unmet need is very high, we are okay with it. So we don't say we only support for urban or only for rural, but as long as on any sub technology we are supporting or innovations we are supporting researchers, as long as it will reach the last mile population, we are staying true to the cause. Likewise, there are many areas, but IHF is extremely focused on primary healthcare. Anything that we support needs to at least be fitting into the primary healthcare. Uh, uh, you know, uh, premise of the zone, you know, which will have interconnections and interoperability again with the high level of care. But whenever we look at innovations, whenever we uh, use our evaluation criteria, unless this sort of, it's, it's, unless it sort of meets the requirement of primary health care, we know that I actually will have to still wait to support something if it's not meeting the requirement. Verticals, if we see, there are many areas and each of these are competing and very important. But IHF is very dedicated and, and, and you know, focused on the neglected infectious diseases, um, tuberculosis, vector borne. These are examples. COVID is not neglected. Yeah, but we do see that COVID has disrupted. That's why it's mentioned here and, and the possibility of moving into platform-based approaches. So, so what we mean by saying we are communicable disease focus is that any platform solution, if it can be extended to non-communicable diseases, we are fine. But tomorrow, if we come across something, let's say, which is solving a cancer-related or, or any other related solution, we will have to see how it can be extended to uh, communicable diseases also. So as long as that continuity is there, we are fine. Likewise, there's a lot of work India has done actually on maternal and child health. And 
for us, that remains our target population. However, we again will be more focused on communicable diseases. And we also know how some of the communicable diseases affect the vulnerable population, which is pregnant women and children. So from that lens, yes. But all of this will only be possible, you know, and be enabled through if we look keep folk, our focus on delivery of care, uh, you know, technologies which can bring that about that change by bringing in data and analytics and novel healthcare financing. Financing, novel financing or blended financing as a lot of the organizations are using in today's, today's time. This is something futuristic. We have not yet gone into novel form. There, there are concepts around uh, blended financing like uh, development bonds, social impact bonds. So we have not gone there, but this is something probably we will explore in the future. But what we are focused on today is, you know, in terms of del better delivery of care, how we can bring at an outcome level more and more novel point of care, miniaturized screening and diagnostic solutions, you know, which will help better services and demand, which will also show better results, better, uh, more affordable, better uh, sort of accuracy, easy to use. And finally, it has to be accessible. But it's not just enough to do that. How does it help the decision makers? How does it help the healthcare providers? You know, how does it support better uh, agile decision making? We will also look into those kind of solutions. And we are, in fact, I'm going to give you some live examples. I'm still talking in theories and our theory of change. So now coming to the disease. So when we started in 2017 and so on, we, I mean, we started very much by identifying, by curating, by understanding the landscape. And I was saying tuberculosis and malaria were a starting point. And we, we sort of identified many problem statements. We curated them. We started looking for innovations and we started supporting also. Then came COVID in 2020. And that's when we said, no, now I think the important piece that needs to be done now is to transition or to evolve from being very disease specific to probably being disease agnostic. While our focus will still be on uh, infectious diseases, can we adopt a platform-based approach, you know, where we should support technologies which can address a wider range of uh, diseases uh, and can be cross-applied. That's what COVID taught us. And that's where we said, and we are still today focused on TB, still focused on vector uh, malaria, but we have broadened. So now we say tuberculosis and other in airborne infections or malaria and other uh, you know, vector-borne diseases. And we are gradually expanding our scope of work. So that has now sort of led to us moving to some focused, you know, areas. We look at prevention, screening, diagnosis, better care pathways, and also, as I was talking about, you know, improved surveillance system, you know, through the use of data and analytics. These are some of our sort of today, the five focus areas that we are looking at. I mean, I'm Kind of, you know, this is just to show that how we are working again today. I'm not going to talk too much about it. I've already spoken about it. These are the areas we are looking at. Now, have we started supporting innovations under each of these areas? No. We have, where we are strong today is our screening and diagnostic focus area. We have come across many innovations. We have supported guided by our overall strategy. We are also supporting, you know, care pathways or better adherence tools, monitoring mechanisms. We are also supporting surveillance, but we, the area of prevention is still something that we are, you know, looking at. We haven't sort of, you know, um, got into it very deeply. Likewise, in future data and analytics, we are supporting, but we want to do more of that by bringing in, uh, you know, by, by extending our support to more on surveillance or, or you know, other kind of uh, areas, problem areas where data analytics could be beneficial. So these are the core areas, you know, where we are more and more evolving from four to five to further areas we are looking at. So that's sort of our pillars, you know, so our theory of change, 
our focus areas, why we do, who we are, uh, but how do we operate? Uh, how do we support where we have reached from, from the start, you know? So when we started in 2017-18, you know, we built a very good stakeholder base. We, we, we developed some very core good partnerships, both uh, with the, some of the government departments, with some of the research institutions, with ICMR. And anyway, we had this huge advantage of being under the Tata Trust umbrella, wherein we had access to the uh, to the last mile, to the communities, through our own presence, through Tata Trust's presence, and also through the NGO community, through hospitals which are running on the ground. So we had one year to the ground and, you know, one year up there to understand, uh, you know, what we are doing. So very quickly, what I'm trying to show here is that we start by identifying gaps, you know, curating problem statements, and then, and which it's not just an in-house exercise. We ensure that whatever we are prioritizing a problem statement is well validated and by the end user, which is the government. And when I say government, it's the largest thing, but deconstructed at state level, district level, NGOs, and even at central level. So that's where we get our use cases from, or the problem statements from. Then we conduct calls. We, now we are open around the year. We look at innovations. We bring the you know, appropriate innovations and we start supporting them. You know, And we pick innovations based on, like I told you, some of the critical criteria. Are they does it make a good problem solution? Fit? Is it sustainable? Is it cost effective? Will it be easy for fund and workers to use? You know, I mean, we are not making, we are not here to support innovations which will just sit in hospitals like Bridge Can. No, we are here for the last mile. So we start selecting and we start supporting. And when we say support, it does include funding support, but we are also ensuring how we can provide that ecosystem access to innovations. Now, this is something commonly said by, I think most, I would say incubators, right? And we are also saying the same, but we are giving direct access to the technical expertise and also to the government, you know, who are the, the implementers. So we get our projects and products continuously evaluated and reviewed by, you know, the, you know, uh, by the government, by, by the end users, you know, is it good? What corrections need to be made? And our vision is that anything that we support needs to be piloted, needs to be demonstrated on the ground once the product is ready and approved by the regulators. How So that it generates more evidence that it's not good in the lab, but it's also good at the point of care or at the healthcare facility level, or it's easy for the patient, depending on what the innovation is. And acceleration towards scale up of innovations is very critical. That's what will make it sustainable. And innovation and TUNAD being one of the big examples, how the entire country came together and today it is very widely available. And similarly, we are supporting many other such innovations, you know. Vision is we are for India, India for India, but anything that we support and if it becomes successful and it helps India, it should also help the other lower and middle income countries, you know, it should be for the world. And as I said already, if we do not support anything that is just fancy, but it has to bring about that change at healthcare outcome level. So it's very clear to us what indicators we will change when we are selecting any innovation. You know, that is very clear to us. Often we have come across very promising technologies, breakthrough technologies, but we have had to keep them in our radar or in our pipeline because we felt it was meant actually for tertiary level care. And we said, okay, fine, when it's, we are keeping a watch on it, but we will support it when it becomes available for primary health care. That is also, that also happens with us. So just a quick summary. So what, so where we are today, I was already telling you, you know, we are sort of, we have screened about 1200 plus innovations so far across different problem areas, the focus areas that I mentioned to you. And we all our uh, partnerships, we have our continuous flow of, you know, innovative proposals that come to us through calls, through the quest for innovations that we do. They come from a partner ecosystem. It comes from uh, various source, various incubators, which are there, you know, which are in early stage. It comes from ICMR, it comes from institutions such as yours. 
So we have supported about 11 innovations, you know, um, uh, and they are still being funded. Some of them have graduated, some are still being funded. And we hope by the end of this financial year, we will add another four to five more. to share with you that about four to five innovations are beginning to enter the healthcare system, the public health system. And I think that is what is something that we feel uh, sort of, you know, humbled by. And we, But that's not enough. How will it still go to the last mile? So it's, it's, it's never, you know, enough to say that we have supported something. It's not, you know, we never, the role of parents, for instance, never end when a child becomes an adult, right? There is always that support that it requires. So our role doesn't end just by supporting the innovations to be ready for the market, but how does it enter into the healthcare system and the market and become accessible is where our sort of uh, focus remains. So um, I guess it's already 3.44 and I'm conscious of time and I should let you also, you know, ask some questions, but, and I, I'll share my deck with all of you, but quickly saying, what are these 11 innovations we are supporting? I'm not going to go uh, into the into the depth of it, but just to give you a glimpse of where we are uh, today, uh, we are supporting these 11 innovations, you know, largely across diagnosis, screening, diagnosis, care pathways, surveillance, and, um, across different areas. Some of them are IoT and artificial intelligence based solutions like your AI, track it now, and we're looking at more, a lot of digital healthcare solutions, but there are also the non-digital healthcare solutions. Trunat has already matured. I mean, it does not need any introduction from my end, all of you know, but we supported it in terms of taking it to various geographies like districts in Uttar Pradesh, it was uh, implemented and deployed at community healthcare centers. We also partnered with FINE during peak COVID to deploy TrueNAD and we did the first bi-directional testing in Mumbai under this with the support of Brihan Mumbai uh, Municipal Corporation. And, and today these machines are, the project is over, you know, a lot of patients benefited by doing the bi-directional testing of for TB and COVID. And today those, uh, machines are lying there. So the project is over. So that's sort of the giving back that has happened. We have also supported, you know, one innovation from our portfolio is in the One Health, uh, you know, space where the product is ready, Sysgen, the third one. Uh, today we are seeing how it can be accelerated, how it can actually go to the farmers. And that's where a lot of learning is. It's not just enough to have a Social, socio-cultural issues. We have learned that the Sysgen product from IIT Madras Incubated Company, uh, great product, fantastic, rare, cost-effective, but farmers are a little worried that if the cattle is identified with bovine TB, will anyone buy milk from them? No, so they may be ostracized. So we are also grappling with those kind of socio-cultural issues. So it's not just enough to have the solution in place? How do you also engage with the right uh, players in the ecosystem or right uh, stakeholders to address those issues? So this, there are also those kind of challenges. Then we are also supporting TB adherence solution. Number five, which is tracked now, is a mosquito, uh, you know, hotspot mapping uh, trap. Uh, and, and they read the, it's, it's an AI uh, enabled solution, which basically reads wing beat frequency and it's deployed now uh, in BMC in Mumbai. And it's also at the same time more and more data is being fed into it to make it a much more robust solution. It's able to differentiate between different species of mosquitoes and also sort of identify the insecticide susceptibility or resistance. Likewise, there are vector borne disease solutions, point of care, uh, Stellar, another very interesting, it's a TB screening uh, solution, not ready. A lot of these are not ready under validation of product development. If this becomes successful, the Stellar product, antigen-based product, it will actually become uh, available at last mile, you know, because 
it's an empty space. You know, today there is no nothing for the last mile population for detecting TB. And so on and so forth. We're supporting this biomarker-based solution for drug resist, for identifying, you know, treatment uh, or, or drug better uh, decision making among uh, this thing, you know, patients, uh, better decision making by physicians, you know. So Yilsec, it's from ISC Bangalore uh, cohort. Then recent something called test at home or 221B, which is actually a sputum collection solution for children, but it can also be used by adults. We have just started supporting it. So, you know, it's going to help children like uh, you know, you take the sputum from children, you know, they find it difficult to cough up. So these are the kind of solutions we are supporting. And they're all in different stages. Two to three have already entered the market, but the others are all either in pilot phase, validation phase, or development phase. But it's equally important for me to mention that she was saying, you know, that is why Tata Trust have created us. And innovation is only as powerful as it is accessible. Otherwise, it will lie in the shelf, right? So, examples, we are supporting Cure AI, we are supporting SenseDose technologies. And Cure AI, as some of you may already know, it's an AI-enabled software, which basically reads multiple chest X-ray scans and is able to uh, detect lung anomalies. Our focus is on TB but it is able to also detect anomalies in various other lung conditions like cancer and many others. Uh, they are also currently looking at COPD and all of that. Now, while it is being developed, but TB use case has been very strong. They And COVID also, you know, they have used it. So it was already adopted and used while they're still putting more and more and more data into it. We have enabled to give them access to 100,000 scans. They have already sort of analyzed uh, 40,000 chest X-ray scans, but there's more to be done. And it's already in use in different five states in the country. And uh, BMC has already used it also uh, during COVID. And it helped more than detection, it was helping progression monitoring. So for different diseases, we are seeing different strengths this particular solution has. So it's already started entering the health system. Why? It, the product is still being refined and fine-tuned and made better for its forecasting and prediction. Likewise, the TB adherence uh, solution, which is a digital healthcare solution, it's, it's a pill box at the end of the day, but it gives alarms to the patients, but also informs the healthcare workers whether a patient is adhering or missing treatment so that those patients can be focused on who are missing the treatment and this helps, therefore, to uh, for patients who adhere to the treatment and not miss. And this has been sort of evaluated by Indian Institute of Public Health, Gandhinagar. It has also a uh, health cost effectiveness study has been done. So the health technology assessment has been approved by Department of Health Research. And now it has gone to Central TV Division for scale up. And they're going to send out a message to all the states to take this within their uh, program implementation plan. So this is basically to show how, while we start from that problem you know, statement, and then we select innovation, support their development, support the evidence generation and pilot demonstration, and then build that pathway for large scale deployment or large scale adoption or scale. Does IHF, can IHF do all of this together? No, you know, we have that critical, funding support and ecosystem support and mentoring support that we enable in that TRL 4567, which is where the value of death is. But we then collaborate with other players to enable some of the facilitation or the pilot use for it. We are very clear on that, that we, we do not, should not do these things on our own. So in summary, this is just a summary slide, just to say that you, know, you can, if you look at the half moon at the bottom, what IHF is largely doing is innovation development. We are facilitating deployment and demonstration of innovations, but none of this is going to be possible if we do not collaborate with different stakeholders. So multi-stakeholder uh, engagement initiatives and co-creation and co-development of initiatives, as we call them, is very critical. That helps us to have more and more innovations in our portfolio. It helps us to support more and more innovations jointly, not just single-handedly, but jointly. And finally, 
create that pathway of India to the world and world to India, that global innovation to me pathway. And ensure that, you know, the silos are bridged, the fragmentation is bridged, resource optimization happens rather than suboptimal spread of funding support. So this is our large goal and this is what we do. I mean, I think I'm going to skip this slide. It's basically saying, you know, our main goal is to improve, you know, early diagnosis in infectious diseases because that's what will help us identify the missing millions, as we say, democratize and increase access to treatment care so that more lives are saved and we can do it in multiple ways. That's the road ahead for us, you know. We should continue and continue to support more and more such innovations. Where do we stand today? What next? I think I'm going to end with this. Uh, is that in the last four to five years, we have supported a lot, you know, but we feel uh, there is a need to sort of bring players together more and more. It's not enough what we have done. So we are thinking of developing an infectious disease focus incubator. Uh, a virtual incubator. So we are not going to develop in uh, brick and mortar, no. But working with some key uh, so institutions in the country who have the labs, who have the infra, we bridge with them, we, we collaborate with them to build, to take the innovations from early stage to the last stage, right? So we all sort of come together, identify more and more infectious disease, you know, uh, technologies which have come from basic sciences, you know, and then we support them through this virtual incubator in future. So we're going to set this up. So we, we have already got sort of um, the support. We have identified the partners. We are bringing more and more partners who can come and join hands to ensure that, you know, sort of this will be probably the India's only sort of dedicated infectious disease focused incubator. Main idea is how we can, and, and we're thinking of launching it in early 2023, all the prep work is happening. At the same time, we are also very cautious and we want to make sure we don't end at incubation. That's not the point. Others are doing it. Our main strength will be how we create that evidence generation, how we take it to the lab, you know, uh, take it to the healthcare system. How, how do we pilot and demonstrate and show in different testing beds, you know, that yes, it will work in a healthcare setting. Likewise, in digital healthcare also, we are sort of very clear, we are not going to support any product development in digital healthcare. India has too many solutions out there. But what is missing is how many of this tech sort of innovation or digital healthcare innovations will work in the healthcare setting. So again, it needs to be piloted. It needs to be guided. It needs to be mentored. The innovators or the developers are working in their own world and own silos. How can we bring bridge that gap between the healthcare system, the end user, and the innovation developer, and right and bring the even the researchers together, you know, and government together. So in a in a sort of a continuous manner, in a comprehensive manner, which will so we're thinking conceptualizing uh, digital healthcare evidence lab. And this is going to be sort of launched in 2023 uh, in a collaborative manner where we also have pooled resources from different, different uh, stakeholders. So this is where we are sort of headed. So with that, I, I would like to thank you for listening uh, very uh, sort of patiently. And I'll take a was there and welcome more and more ideas. Thank you, Jaita, for the wonderful talk and taking us through the journey, how YHS evolved and all the mandates and all the stories. It was really intriguing. Um, we'll maybe take up the couple of questions that we have here. And they're from Dr. Rajesh Pandey. Uh, very good talk, Jaita. So I'm going one by one. Yeah. Sure. In the domain of surveillance, is there a focus on genomic surveillance beyond SARS-CoV-2? You know, and we have come across quite a few and we still are looking at it as a focus. I must say, yes, the challenge we have been faced with because we are defined in a certain way and the mandate and the MOA and the AOAs, which have sort of been laid out by the Tata Trust, you know, is that how do we create this mechanism which will ultimately help the uh, 
um, you know, the, the population in the end. Uh, we have come across fantastic institutions, and I know your institute is one of the sort of pioneers and, and you know, like leaders in this area. What is happening is that we are still seeing a lot of the sequencing happening at a very high, I mean, at a tertiary level, at a high level. How can we get, how can you, you know, what role can we play? Yes, as an area of interest, very important. We would like to, but how can we sort of de, sort of democratize it, you know, you know, take it gradually to that, to the next level of care. You know, that is where we are. I mean, so to answer your question, yes, um, but how do we do it is where we need to discuss, think, and strategize, you know, so that it does not remain at tertiary level and at very national level and we take democratize it here. Yeah. Thank you. The second question is, point of care sequencing was wondering whether I can reach out to IHF along with the clinical partner with strategy for point of care sequencing. If yes, any specific diseases on IHF priority or can it be based on disease load of the hospital at the catchment area? Yes. So first of all, yes, you're always welcome. And this is what we sort of our partnership with different institutions have helped us that, you know, we have been doing this call and all, that's okay. But what we have realized is something that comes for extremely well-known and reputed institutions like yours, we would have welcomed it more because I know it's coming, we know it coming through, it's coming through that channel, which is crossed through various stages. So yes, definitely you can. Disease focus is there, like I said, um, this still remains one of the massive focus for us, other airborne diseases, influenza. I mean, you know, in, in, I know the Western world talks more about influenza, but uh, we are also sort of open, but we are also looking at other infections, you know, like the vector-borne diseases. So we are, we are open to discussing. Uh, we'll have to see the burden of the disease, the country, where it is in terms of prioritization. So we would be open to exploring with you for sure, as long as, you know, again, you know, the primary healthcare focus remains. Be and as I mentioned also, we are very keen at this point on platform-based innovation. So if some of this, I, I, we would be very enthused. I think my team uh, actually clearing this out, but they would be very keen to look at point of care sequencing if, if that is available. I mean, we would definitely want to set up some discussion. Great. And uh, the third question from Dr. Rajesh Pandey is learning from polio virus detection through wastewater surveillance. Can preventive surveillance be considered by Absolutely. IHF in a question specific manner? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. This is again part of a problem statement. We have put it out even in the last call we closed. We got a proposal and I'm very keen. We look into it. But so the, diff the I want to make one statement sort of very clear that we are not in the basic sciences part, right? So we allow institutions like yourselves to be focused. We pick up things as the research has progressed from early stage to mid stage, which will help us. We were all, we are aware, you know, we just read some news from US a uh, few days back where there have been a, a sort of a splurge of polio cases and the, they have seen the, uh, the virus in wastewater and, and so we are very keen to answer that very simple question we are very keen and as long as we can find some of the right partners i think we would be keen to look at that and we can strategize you know and when i say we don't look at early stage research what i mean is if there are players from our partners in the ecosystem who can sort of support the early stage research and then IHF sort of comes in at sort of that mid stage and late stage to accelerate it or, or to fast track it. Yes, so we would like to work in collaboration and look into this area. I'm not committing right now. I'm not in a position to make that commitment because it has an approval system, but we are very open to explore. And this is a problem statement pretty much in our portfolio as well, yes. Thank you, Jaita. Um, are there any further questions? Please type in either the uh, chat box or the question answer box and we can take them up. 
So I do remember in our uh, previous conversation that we had, Jayita, that there was some technology readiness level from which um, IHF kind of funds. So, right. Right. Yeah, so, so are, you, are you sort of asking me and what technology readiness level we support? Is that? Yeah, maybe for the participants, you can kind of elaborate a bit more on that. Yes, yes. So see, we have also evolved, you know, that's what I would say. When we started, and even now, when IHF solely funds something, uh, we do look at a higher TRM level. So we typically look at TRM 5 and above, uh, which is where the value of death starts in terms of funding. Uh, but we have also evolved and we are we have also now re-strategized, whereas we say as long as we have a good consortium of funders, you know, and we can join hands to pick up even a little earlier. We can, because if we have a consortium based approach and there's co-funding and match funding available, so we could look at something, maybe at TR3 and 4 as well, whereas wherein, you know, some of our co-funders are supporting the early stage and we come in at slightly late stage. But that arrangement sort of remains right uh, from the beginning. That in the journey of this particular research to innovation to product, we all sort of commit to it and we all come in at different stage and not leave it to the poor researcher and to the innovator to figure out all of this. We all come in to make that commitment right from the start. As long as it's a key problem area, it is focusing. So yes, I would say we solo, we still look at the TRL 5 and above, but whenever we have a co-founder and a collaborative approach, we definitely would even be open to looking at something a little earlier. Thank you. Um, since there are no further questions and in the interest of time, maybe uh, we come to the end of this webinar. Thank you so much for your time and coming here and sharing your experience and expertise with us. And we look forward to further conversations, continued ones, yeah? Yes, thank absolutely. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh,